Welcome. In this exciting episode, we're going to discuss the basal ganglia. And our study aims are to understand the organization uh, of the basal ganglia, touching on things like transmitters. Uh, we're going to try and discuss the functions of the basal ganglia and discuss what happens um, clinically when the basal ganglia function uh, goes wrong. Let's briefly first start off by going over the role of the basal ganglia. Um, and uh, just want to mention that actually we're still not 100% sure how the basal ganglia work and exactly what they do. Uh, a few years ago there were some very um, good theories and new information has come in that sort of cancelled out those theories and there's new research being done and there's lots of arguments among researchers and different articles published in different journals. Um, but this is a rough consensus as to the state of knowledge on the basal ganglia function um, in the year um, uh, 2013-2014. <coughs> so it modulates movement in response to uh, motivation. Uh, in other words, uh, in the presence of an emotional stimulus, it can trigger movement or change movement. Um, so, for example, if you're extremely hungry and I put a delicious plate of food in front of you, you may feel a tense, uh, strong sort of impulse to move and eat that food. Um, and the basal ganglia is part of what's sort of triggering that desire to move in response to motivation. People with lesions of the basal ganglia might lose this ability to move in response to motivation. They might be dying of starvation, but if you put a plate of food in front of them, they won't be able to eat the food, or they won't feel a desire to move towards the food and eat it. If you uh, put a piece of food in their mouth, they'll chew it and swallow it, and if you tell them you can eat it, that's fine, but um, well then they might even be able still uh, to eat it, but um, they um, will struggle to um, initiate motor responses in response to motivation, which is basically what that first point is talking about. It seems to contribute to motor learning, especially for the acquisition of new skills uh, or for improving um, old skills. Um, it was once for basal ganglia store um, memory traces uh, for motor skills. Uh, that seems to be unlikely. Um, that said, uh, they still play a massive role in making new memory traces in different parts of the cerebral cortex in response to uh, new skills. And if you have a basal ganglia lesion, uh, you will struggle to develop new skills and you will struggle to improve your old skills. So for example, uh, you can learn how to play the piano or drive a car before you get a basal ganglia lesion. After you get a basal ganglia lesion, um, you will struggle to learn to drive a car, you will struggle to play uh, a, um, a piano, you will always be at the absolute beginner stage no matter how hard you try to learn the skill. The basal ganglia suppress competing actions, specifically in autoric systems, so um, they, uh, they seem to suppress um, muscle uh, groups so that um, if you're trying to extend your arm, um, it prevents uh, the flexion of um, your flexors so that your arms can properly um, extend as an example. In other words, it, it um, cancels out uh, com um, paradoxical um, muscle contractions. To control the magnitude of the movement, so um, if uh, you're trying to touch your nose with your finger, you're not slapping your face all the time. Uh, because the basal ganglia are uh, helping to control the speed of movement and the extent of the movement, preventing you from slapping your face every time you try to touch your nose with your finger. And in a similar vein, it corrects motor movement signals. So uh, if your brain is telling your arm to go straight up and there's some sort of misfiring and the arm is actually flailing to the side, uh, such as with your acetotic patient, uh, if your basal ganglia are properly functioning, they will cancel out those acetotic tendencies so that your arm can move smoothly, straight and up. Major components of the basal ganglia um, are the striatum, and the striatum actually consists of the chordate nucleus and the putamen, the globus pallidus, uh, the substantia nigra, uh, which is also 
uh, which also extends into the midbrain um, of the brain stem. So you might have seen that um, in the other lecture on the functional organization of the brain, the nucleus accumbens, and the subthalamic nucleus, which obviously is um, just below the thalamus, in contrast to the rest, which are lateral uh, to the thalamus. So the striatum, as mentioned, chordate nucleus plus putamen equals striatum, composed mostly of medium spiny neurons. Um, I don't know exactly why they call them medium. Um, I suppose that the histologists have some sort of measurement criteria, and they have lots of uh, lots and lots of dendrites from the neurosoma, so it looks like they have lots of tiny spines. That's why they're called spiny neurons. And they primarily use gamma amino butyric acid as a neurotransmitter um, and gamma amino butyric acid or GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. It suppresses the function of the next neuron. So these medium spiny neurons release GABA and then the ne next neurons in the that they're connected to they are suppressed, they are inhibited. Now the striatum is the main area of input into the basal ganglia system. Uh, basically what you're going to learn in this lecture is that the basal ganglia, all those structures of basal ganglia are organized into a little bit of, a, almost like a little electrical circuit. And there's only one sort of place to go in and one place to go out. And the place to go in is the striatum. And if there's damage to the striatum, um, then the entire basal ganglia system is um, disrupted because uh, even if every other little um, part of the basal ganglia system is still functioning. Without the striatum to bring in input from the rest of the brain, those uh, other basal ganglia components are going to be useless. And that there's, there's no other way of them get receiving any sort of neuro nerve signals uh, from the rest of the brain in the absence of a working striatum. As such, um, most conditions that um, involve pathology of the basal ganglia probably involve the striatum, because if you knock out the striatum, you basically knock out the entire basal ganglia system. So Parkinson's disease um, involves the basal ganglia, Huttington's uh, Tourette's and uh, various dystonias tend to involve the striatum. Next up, the globus pallidus, which is divided into internal and external globus pallidus. Uh, so it's also referred to as globus pallidus interna, or GPI, and globus pallidus externa, GPE. And uh, like the striatum, they also consist primarily of GABAergic neurons, with gamma amino butyric acid, therefore they're inhibitory. <coughs> they are wired um, into the thalamus, so the primary function appears to inhibit thalamic function. So thalamic, uh, the thalamus is the router of all signals going um, around from the brain into the body and around the brain between different parts. Uh, specifically in terms of motoric function, motor signals going from the precentral gyrus going through the thalamus into the body are inhibited by the globus pallidus, therefore preventing excess movements. And globus pallidus interna is the main transport area for motor uh, the main transit area for motor output of the basal ganglia. So whereas the striatum was the main input, um, globus pallidus interna is the main output center of the basal glang ganglia. But um, if you have an isolated lesion only of the globus pallidus internus, um, there's no gross clinical fallout. There is some mild clinical uh, fallout uh, if you measure it in uh, research laboratories, but you know, if you see a person with uh, such a lesion walking in the street, you wouldn't realize that there was something wrong with them. And furthermore, if there's inactivation of the globus pallidus internus, either through surgical removal, a pallidotomy, or if you insert electrodes into it and basically fry it at regular periods, preventing it from functioning, which is called deep brain stimulation, and you basically knock out the ability of the basal ganglia to have output, you then end up having uh, improvement of symptoms where you have striatal diseases, such as Parkinson's and some of the dystonias. <coughs> the the so take-home message being um, that bits have no basal ganglia output uh, compared to erroneous basal, 
ganglia output. So if you don't have that striatum inhibiting the basal ganglia system, uh, you then have bizarre clinical manifestations, but if you can then knock out the output of the basal ganglia system at the globus pallidus internus, uh, you can cancel out those sim uh, symptoms, which um <coughs> means that there's still quite a lot of controversy as to what exactly the basal ganglia does and how it affects people and what is, is its exact purpose seeing as how um, on a superficial level at least there doesn't seem to be that much clinical fallout from uh, knocking out your globus pallidus internus in your entire basal ganglia system. That's not to say there is no 100% no clinical fallout. There is some problems with motivation um, for movement, um, especially if you knock out the um, basal ganglia system. Uh, if you damage enough of the basal ganglia system, you won't be able to pick up new skills. Um, but these are sort of subtle clinical things that you'd only pick up um, over sort of a long time. That's not something obvious and in your face, um, as as it were. The substantial nigra lying just dorsal to the cerebral peduncles, sometimes described as being part of the cerebral peduncles as part of the midbrain, and they are a transit area for some motor output, and they divide into two regions. The inhibitory reticulata, now the substantial nigra reticulata, and excitatory substantial nigra compacta. And the compacta area, the excitatory area, is dopaminergic. Dopamine is the excitatory neurotransmitter, so that makes sense. And there's a, there's a high level of neuromelanin uh, in the substantia nigra compacta, and this neuromelanin uh, basically pigments the neurons um, black in this region, and therefore they are the black substance or substantia nigra, if you had to say it in Latin. So you would see that on dissection. The reticulata area, however, is uh, more like the globus pallidus. It's gabinergic and it inhibits the thalamus. If there's atrophy of the substantia nigra compacta, uh, such as in Parkinson's disease, where you have the uh, death of those dopaminergic neurons, uh, you lose the excitatory function of the substantia nigra compacta, and therefore the inhibitory functions of the basal ganglia uh, become uh, more relative to the excitatory functions. There's a loss of balance between inhibition and excitation. So with the loss of that excitation, we then have relative over-inhibition of muscle movement, and that's why with Parkinson's disease, you get that rigidity. Okay, so the subthalamic nucleus. Um, is an area of the basal ganglia which is exclusively excitatory, so unlike other areas which are divided into inhibitory and excitatory parts, the subthalamic nucleus is exclusively excitatory, uses glutamate as its neurotransmitter, and it receives inhibitory signals from the globus pallidus externa, and as the globus pallidus externa uh, secretes um, gamma aminobutyric acid, GABA, and then dumps it at the subthalamic nucleus in order to inhibit it. Um, but if the subthalamic nucleus is not inhibited, it will then uh, send glutamate and other excitatory signals to the substantia nigra reticulata. But we'll go over the, the way that wor um, it works in, uh, um, in one of the slides on, um, on the indirect pathway. The nucleus accumbens um, is part of the basal ganglia, um, and it brings emotion into your movement. It has a strong role in emotional drive, and impulsive movements that urge to make a movement. Uh, it's thought to be um, overactive in pa patients which, uh, who have Tourette sy syndrome, for example, as responsible for goal-oriented movements. Lesions of the nucleus accumbens specifically uh, destroy your ability to uh, engage in goal oriented movements. Um, you can be starving, sitting starving in a corner of the room, and a delicious meal is on the other side of the room, and we tell you, okay, you can go eat that meal because you're hungry, yet you'll find yourself unable to move your body uh, in response to that motivation. It's also got a role to play in drug addiction. Um, it seems to have a major role in stimulating that need to um, to search out 
for uh, for drugs that in polls to get dr more drugs um, as such. <coughs> I touched a little bit on how all the different parts are wired and now we're going to go deep into the sort of wiring of the basal ganglia and how all the structures are related to each other and unfortunately uh, this is something that uh, you have to know if you really want to understand the basal ganglia. I've already mentioned that the basal ganglia receives input via the striatum and it may it pretty much only receives input from the motor cortex. cortex. In other words, the precentral gyrus, it only receives movement signals. So movement signals do not only just go through the corticospinal tract down to your muscles, some of the signals are also sent into the basal ganglia for modulation of the corticospinal tract. The basal ganglia as a whole will then give output to the thalamus, um, which then alters the function, uh, the way the corticospinal tracts that go through the thalamus work. And then there's also signals going back to the precentral gyrus, telling the precentral gyrus, listen, over here um, you're giving over too many motor signals, or over here giving too few m m motor signals, and so forth. Um, altering the function of the precentral gyrus as well. Now, because of the way the basal ganglia are wired, uh, there are two pathways that a motor signal can take through the basal ganglia. We divide that into direct and indirect pathway. <coughs> Starting with the direct pathway, uh, it's also referred to as the hyperkinetic pathway. You have the cerebral cortex, specifically the precentral gyrus. It sim sends a signal to the striatum and the striatum is stimulated. Remember the striatum consists of um, uh, medium spiny neurosomas that are uh, gavinergic and that is they inhibit whatever they're wired to. The striatum is wired to the substantia nigra reticulata and the globus pallidus interna. The striatum therefore inhibits the substantia nigra reticulata and it inhibits the globus pallidus interna. Globus pallidus interna is wired to inhibit the thalamus. By inhibiting the inhibitor, um, there, therefore we have actually more activation of the thalamus. The substantia nigra reticulata is also an inhibitor of the thalamus. By inhibiting the inhibitor, we again have the same effect. We have more uh, uh, activity of the thalamus because we've cancelled the activity of the substantia nigra reticulata and we've cancelled out the globus pallidus interna. This then uh, means that the thalamus uh, can activate more and it sends more signals to the motor cortex. Therefore, we call this hyperkinetic stimulation because it's stimulating um, signals in the precentral gyrus, which will result in relatively more movement. Uh, signals being sent from the precentral gyrus, which will lead to relatively more movement um, in the end. That is a bit confusing. Uh, make a nice line diagram for yourself. Go through it a few times. Um, uh, as I said, it, it's something that you have to memorize. It's not terribly logical, but if you make a nice line diagram with arrows and carefully understand how the structures are wired together and how inhibiting uh, something that inhibits something else can cause stimulation of the end organ, um, then you'll have, um, uh, then you'll be able to understand what's going on. But I strongly suggest draw a line diagram and make sure you understand it before going on to the next pathway. The indirect pathway, also referred as the hyperkinetic pathway, starts at the same place. Pre-central gyrus sends a signal to the striatum. The striatum is an inhibitory brain organ. It inhibits the globus pallidus externa. The globus pallidus externa is wired to the subthalamic nucleus. The globus pallidus externa is also an inhibitory organ. So when the striatum inhibits this inhibitory organ, its target organ is then going to actually have increased activity. It is inhibiting the inhibitor, freeing the subthalamic nucleus to work. Remember the subthalamic nucleus uses glutamate, it's an excitatory um, area of the basal ganglia. The subthalamic nucleus is therefore less inhibited and can excite more the, the organ that it's connected to, which is the substantia nigra reticulata. 
and the globus pallidus interna. With stimulation of the substantia nigra reticulata and the globus pallidus interna, these two organs are then um, stimulated to inhibit their target organ, which is the thalamus, which results in decreased stimulation of the motor cortex, therefore decreased motor signals, therefore decreased movement. Therefore, uh, if you have to activate this pathway, a decreased movement, you have hypokineticism. That's why it's called the hypokinetic pathway. So the result of the indirect, uh, indirect pathway is that you have inhibition of movement, you have hypokineticism, or as I put it there, hypokinetic inhibition. Now, you have these two pathways through the basal ganglia, and they are both constantly working, constantly active. And there's almost like a homeostatic balance between the two. Uh, they're constantly working against each other, balancing against each other, allowing um, movement to neither be too much nor too little. But now, well, what about that substantia nigra compacta, that um, excitatory area um, that has all that neuromelanin and dopaminergic tracts? Well, they're wired to this directly um, to the striatum, and we're not quite sure how this works, because strictly speaking, um, if you stimulate the striatum, you should then have activation of both pathways. But somehow, the uh, striatum is wired or made in such a way that dopamine only encourages the direct pathway and doesn't enc uh, encourage any activation of indirect pathway when activating the striatum. And that's a little medical mystery which we haven't really solved yet as such. Now, if we had degeneration of the substantia nigra compacta with death of that dopaminergic excitatory pathway that stimulates the direct pathway, we lose the direct pathway. We lose the hyperkinetic pathway. In other words, we lose the ability to um, uh, have increased stimulation of the motor cortex. So what does that mean? We only now have the indirect pathway, unopposed, uh, no antagonism against this pathway. We therefore have a relatively overactive indirect pathway, resulting in relatively overactive inhibition of the motor cortex. Therefore, rigidity and slowness, the slowness of movement is typical of Parkinson's disease and Parkinsonian type illnesses. Just briefly, let's have a look at different ways that uh, the basal ganglia can go wrong. Um, if we remove the globus pallidus interna, which effectively knocks out basal ganglia output, there's some mild clinical features that are not uh, alter, uh, always apparent at first glance. There can be some mild bradykinesia or moderate bradykinesia, and there's a bit of a slowness of movement, which suggests that. Um, uh, the corticospinal tracts are already wired to rather give too little um, movement than too much, and it's up to the basal ganglia to upregulate it as necessary. But that's just a hypothesis. And as I said uh, in an earlier slide, there's lots of new research constantly being done on the basal ganglia, and the theories around it change every few years. There's also a decreased ability to learn new skills. So you still have your old skills. If you knew how to play the piano before, you'll still be able to play the piano, but you won't be able to learn how to play another instrument afterwards. Okay, Parkinson's disease, I've discussed quite in depth in the previous uh, slide, the disease of an overactive and direct pathway, therefore there's a lot of inhibition of movement and loss of the ability to move, um, and loss of the ability to move in response to motivation. Uh, which is referred to as sort of the paralysis of the will. Now, it's some Parkinson's patients are not quite paralyzed, but uh, it's almost as if they were paralyzed because they cannot will themselves to move uh, in response to motivation, unless there's a very dramatic uh, stimulus that can have uh, kickstart them um, in certain situations. So, um, a well-known phenomenon is a patient with severe Parkinson's disease who sits in his chair the whole day, never moves out of his chair, has to be taken in a wheelchair everywhere, um, 
and then as soon as there is um, an emergency they'll suddenly jump out of the chair after having not moved for a couple of months and quickly dial um, an ambulance as such um, suddenly regaining complete control of their bodies just because they're finally uh, in a sort of intense emotional situation sometimes that motivational abilities will be able to kickstart and over and override the, the the paralysis of the will as it were so we call parkinson's disease a hypokinetic disease a disease of sm uh, less movement on the other hand huntington's disease which is a genetic illness where you have degeneration of the striatum the striatum um, um, being the inhibitory structure of the basal ganglia um, and for some reason this causes more loss of the indirect pathway function. You'd think it would cause loss of both pathways but um, I guess that dopamine from the substantia nigra um, compactor can still stimulate the direct pathway a little bit despite the generation of, the generation of striatum. That's just a hypothesis on my part. But um, we have the generation of the striatum um, and this preferentially causes loss of indirect pathway function therefore the direct pathway is um, relatively overactive there's excess stimulation of motor cortex and patients with Huntington's disease are struggle to control their movements if they try and raise their arm, their arm uh, fl flies all over the place if they try to touch your nose they accidentally slap you um, um, if they try to shake your hand, the arm keeps flying, flying left to right, they can't seem to get it into the correct place. So it's hyperkineticism, an excess of movement. Um, patients on antipsychotics sometimes develop uh, dystonia, which is very bizarre sort of movements and um, sort of hyperkineticism. So I think it might be due to changes in the dopamine receptors in the basal ganglia and that causes that system to be oversensitive to dopamine causing it to be overactive and then they develop excess movements and flailing movements um, and um, it's quite a thing to see, I've seen it a few times, I even saw it once in the, uh, in the GP practice not just in emergency units um, the one story I'd like to tell you once upon a time in Ramalodi um, a patient was having a headache and you know he didn't have anything in the house, so he decided, you know, let me just take my brother's tablets. Um, uh, maybe they'll help for my headache. He took a whole bunch of his brother's tablets, and he came into the emergency complaining that he was unable to stop moving. He was literally holding himself to the desk while his legs uh, were moving and his body was moving. It literally looked like he was dancing on the spot, um, holding on for dear life uh, to the desk. And it turns out his brother was actually a psychiatric patient and he had taken some antipsychotics and now he had activated his um, direct pathway in the basal ganglia and now he was moving around like uh, basically dancing in one spot and feeling very freaked out because he had absolutely no control whatsoever over these movements. Uh, we gave him an injection of aconitin which is um, a dopamine antagonist and within 30 minutes uh, the movements had greatly calmed down we gave him another injection and then he was fine we gave him some um, orphanodrine which is also um, a dopamine antagonist um, just to drink at home um, just to prevent the symptoms from reoccurring so that's one interesting story um, it is it was quite difficult for me to make the diagnosis the first time I saw it because um, you don't see it that often but once you've seen it and once you've made a diagnosis you'll remember it for the rest of your life so remember um, always consider this diagnosis in a patient that's complaining of being unable to control his movement um, and in a patient that's otherwise well because you might be thinking the patient is just making it up or pretending to be sick for whatever reason but it's an actual real clinical uh, disease entity um, I also r remember uh, one patient who went to see a psychiatrist, psychiatrist changed his medication and he started developing this condition as he was driving home from Joburg um, so even in a GP practice um, they can present because uh, this was at the GP practice um, and also it's important to reassure the patient because it is a frightening condition to have when your body is completely out of your control and it's moving all over the place very easy to treat, um, it can um, can 
be very, uh, somewhat fatal or can be fatal if you don't treat it because um, the movements can become so excessive that um, um, they generate a lot of body heat uh, they develop metabolic acidosis from all the lactic acid um, and develop a whole sort of cascade of metabolic events so uh, it's not a laughing matter as such but it can look quite funny um, uh, as it is um, as it were if you see a patient standing in, like I saw standing in a corner holding onto a table trying to basically dance in one spot or trying not to dance in one spot okay so that was a long story let's move on to the next point um, the basal ganglia is thought to play a role in numerous movement disorders um, for example Tourette's uh, various dystonias and obsessive compulsive disorder it's hard to say exactly what it does or if it even if it does um, have a huge role to play because these conditions usually have multiple problems in multiple brain regions when you do brain scans it's difficult to decide what region is really the main culprit uh, in these conditions and what exactly what exactly the role the basal ganglia would be and those are my references and I may as well make this an embarrassing admission uh, I was struggling to understand from my references exactly how um, the different parts of the basal ganglia are wired and I ended up having to go to with the Wikipedia page which I put on here and the Wikipedia page actually does a pretty good job of explaining uh, the circuitry of the basal ganglia and how everything is wired um, so if you struggle to understand what I was talking about in this lecture um, you can um, go to the basal ganglia Wikipedia page Wikipedia is not always correct sometimes it, uh, sometimes there is uh, wrong stuff in it um, but I compared the Wikipedia page to information from my references and they were seemed reasonably accurate and the wiring uh, at section at least um, is accurate so um, you can check that out if you're struggling to understand the wiring of the basal ganglia